<laughs> Good evening. My name is Denise Melholland. I'm founder of African American Women of Lake Oswego and surrounding areas. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to my volunteer colleague and friend, J. Risha Brandon, better known as Jay. It's so very rare to meet a fellow STEM, STEM of course is science, technology, engineer, and math success story, who is not only a civil engineer, but also committed to the field of environmentalism talented in visual arts and a social media expert. Jay was born and raised in Portland. She's an alumni of University of Portland with a degree of civil engineering. Jay is also a licensed professional engineer, environmental engineer, and a Harvard Climate Justice Design Fellow. Jay currently works as a design engineer and project manager for the city of Portland. If you know Jay, she's passionate about accessibility and inclusion for communities of color, particularly in the STEM areas. Outside of work, Jay is a lifelong volunteer, currently holding roles in a variety of community organizations. She is the current president of the National Association of Black Engineers, Portland chapter. She was previously the NAACP Environmental Justice Chair. She holds leadership roles in Good in the Hood Festival Planning Committee and active in African American women of Lake Oswego and surrounding areas. When Jay is not being interviewed on NPR and other media news outlets, in her spare time, she manages a small vintage resale business and is an artist. Jay's work was selected this year for the Jordan Schnitzer Black Lives Matter Artist Grant Program, and her artwork was displayed at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum. Jay is also the founder of Brandon Diversity and Engineering Scholarship Program, which provides scholarships to BIPOC female students enrolled in the University of Portland's Chiley School of Engineering. With that being said, I present to you this evening's Women's BIPOC Speak Series speaker, Jay Risha Brandon. thank you for having me and particularly to my dear friend Denise Milholland for thinking of me for this event. There's a quote, I'm not sure who said it, but it is surround yourself with women who mention your name in a room full of opportunities. Mm. And I feel so lucky to have mentors, peers, and friends who do this for me and it's something I like to do in return. My name is Dreisha Brannon, a name that until recently has been shortened to J for others' ease. Taking ownership of my full name is a separate story, um, but if we have more time, I'll dive into that significance. But following with the theme, I'll begin with the beginning. What is my story? I'm a born and raised Portlander. My father's family has been in Portland since the 1940s. They were not directly in Vanport, but they followed cousins who were. And they began a leg legacy of three generations of teachers in Portland, Oregon. On my mother's side, she is second generation Filipino-American. My grandmother married a U.S. Navy soldier and left her province, province in Pangasinan in Manila. So many of my passions originate from the nurture my parents provided and particularly my mother sought out. We are a very close family, we talk every day, and I have stayed in Portland to be close with them. The pictures to my left depict my mother, father, and my little sister. There's a couple oldies in there too. Now, a little about me. I graduated from the University of Portland in 2015 with a degree in civil engineering and a minor in environmental science. 
Prior to graduating, I had started a job working for the city of Portland within construction management for the Bureau of Environmental Services. Nearly eight years later, a few promotions and trying different roles in different groups, my day job is now a design civil engineer and project manager for the same bureau. The Bureau of Environmental Services for the civil, uh, city of Portland manages several portfolios, but my work is specifically within the collection systems engineering division, as well as the wastewater treatment of special projects. I have managed over $40 million in capital projects. I've had experience in a variety of roles, engineering technician, project manager, designer, construction manager, all with water in different forms. Waste, potable, or what drinking water is, and storm water, which is a big deal for Portland. I'm going to share some pictures of my work because I'm often asked, what does an engineer do? What is a project manager? And these are things that every day have a lot to do with our daily lives. To my left is a picture of the Mount Tabor Reservoir. I was lucky enough to work on this historical preservation project, which rehabilitated this reservoir. Right now in this picture, it looks uh, not filled. It wasn't filled for about 12 years, um, but I was responsible for managing the construction phase of a restoration of all the concrete and parapet walls. Now if you go to Mount Tabor, you can see this filled. This is the Leaf Erickson Trail in Forest Park. It has a culvert installation. Culverts function primarily to convey water from one side of a road or obstruction to the other. This one functioned to prevent water from washing out the trails that a lot of Portlanders and actually people all over the state come to visit. There's people next to the pipes in the picture for scale. These are almost you fit a whole person in them. They also have baffles and stormwater rocks that are to kind of mimic actual rivers. These serve um, like fish habitat too. It's a really amazing project for biomimicry. This is one of the examples um, and exercises in problem solving, an alternative analysis of my job as a design engineer. This is a collapsed manhole next to a railroad. It goes underneath a very important parking lot for a very famous uh, venue in Portland. And it also had a lot of environmental permitting. So these are some of the problem solving I get to do as a design engineer. This is cured in place pipe. This is what we call trenchless rehabilitation. This method is trenchless, which means that it has limited impact to community around us. And that's one of the ways where we try to prevent uh, interference with the community. So we don't want to dig up the road next to you all the time. So this method of rehabilitation is um, using the existing hose pipe. Sometimes our pipes in our cities are still made with brick. I've even seen some with wood. So this trenchless rehabilitation is really neat because it creates a structural reinforcement. All right, that's enough nerding out on the actual project, but I did want to describe where I spend about 40 hours and more per week of my life. <laughs> now backing up a little bit to how I became an engineer. I come from a long line of teachers, which is part of the reason edu education became a priority for me, particularly in science. I always knew I was going to be a scientist or an engineer as a child. I actually thought I was going to be a paleontologist for a while too. But I chose civil engineering because it is the engineering that gives back to people. It's often called the people's engineering. But I started engineering from a passion in Legos. I was lucky enough to have a mother who drove me across, across town to public magnet schools. My elementary years were at Buckman Elementary, which is an arts magnet. My middle school year was a drastic change into STEM, so at a math-focused school called Winter Haven. I was not very athletic, so my sport was like robotics. It was a perfect fit for my creative passion <laughs> of building anything I could out of recycled trash and recycling. At my parents' house, I would make rockets out of oatmeal containers. So Lego Robotics was the perfect fit. This is a picture of my first robotics team. They were called Blood, Sweat, and Gears. <laughs> this team and my mentors were an integral part of my choice to pursue a lifelong interest in engineering. Whoa. Dean Kamen, inventor of the Segway, started first, F-I-R-S-T, which was a way to get more youth engaged in engineering. He knew kids like robots, and he was right. This was such a great way of getting youth interested in STEM. First robotics competitions are sometimes called the Nerd Olympics. 
and they are so much fun. This is some of my favorite memories. I gained exposure to mechanical engineering, project management, a design pitch, and community service, all verbiage I didn't know what it was at that time. The foundation of my engineering career began with FIRST, also where I began to notice that I was one of the few girls and usually one of the only people of color. I think it helped me prepare me for a career, my nine to five, where that was pretty much the norm. Reiterating myself to be heard, standing up for my ideas, and having a dominant communication style was a requirement to thrive. Turns out being bossy is a, transfers very well into construction management. <laughs> and this is a picture of my high school robotics team. We were called the Pig Mice, and that team still exists at Cleveland High School. We had, you can see on the robot to the left, we were sponsored by Boeing and FedEx Office, and the Lego robot on the right was my middle school robot, where I learned about gear trains and technic parts. While engineering is my day job, service and community have always been pillars of who I am. And it takes up almost any spare time that I have. I have volunteered for as long as I can remember. Uh, my mother always initiated and instilled the value of gratitude and giving back to the community that raised me. Here are some pictures of some various projects. I volunteered with Multnomah County Library for over eight years as a summer reading volunteer and a member of the Hollywood Library Teen Council, putting on youth programming for teens. I was a community organizer before I knew what that was. They even put my face on the side of a library truck when I was in college, which at that time was highlighting long-term volunteers in their library. The picture to the right of that is me teaching a weaving class with one of my students at Buckman Elementary School for the Schools Uniting Neighborhoods Program. I just call it SUN. The picture on the left is STEM outreach during my time at University of Portland as the Vice President of the American Society of Civil Engineers. We were building it <laughs> licorice and I believe those are marshmallows and toothpick bridges to try and have kids <laughs> the most things. <laughs> so this is some youth engagement even in college. I don't know how we had time when I was studying. And on the right is something super fun, and that's with DPAY, which is a nonprofit that removes impervious surfaces like concrete to build community gardens. So these are just some of the various projects. And when I talk about community, the community that raised me, I'm talking about how I was lucky to be exposed to many community programs and extracurriculars as a, at a young age. Most of all, contributing to the passion that I have now as an adult. I've already touched on Lego Robotics at Winter Haven, but throughout Portland, my mom sought out resources and activities that highlighted art, math, STEM engagement, nature, and service, most of which were free or at a very low cost. I learned to weave at Buckman Elementary School's SUN program, which ended up being my first job. I started teaching weaving, and then I ended up teaching math, other art classes, history, Lego Robotics, and coaching my own Lego Robotics team. This picture in the middle shows me with a first-generation iPod weaving, which shows my age at the time. I also took dozens of Saturday Academy classes for STEM engagement, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Saturday Academy still exists today. I took several classes, dozens, I'm truly honest, dozens, and landed my first internship at Portland State University studying greenhouse emissions from native plants in Oregon. So the picture on the left is me in a lab coat and goggles. I think that might have been a microbiology class. And the picture on the right of it is me with the flux chambers I designed to catch, and, um, catch air and see the increases as time went on. So I designed those flux cha chambers and got to research the methane emissions. The research I did at 17 is still cited on the professor's website. I also participate on panels now for current ACE apprentices. I also took piano lessons with Ethos during their origination years. It was a pilot at that time, and Ethos is now a commonplace name in music education for Portlanders. Teaching piano also helped pay for college, and I'm still in contact with my former student, and she's a bit of a mentee that I keep in touch with. My years of service paired with academics helped earn my crown as a Rose Festival princess at my high school. 
Contrary to many thoughts, it is not a pageant, but a service-based scholarship program. I also love to say that I'm so poor when I was a Rose Festival princess. <laughs> All of these experiences and opportunities were part of the village that raised me. My weaving teacher, my Sun School coordinator, my piano teachers, my libraries are all some of the community who raised me, and I think of them whenever I give back. In my youth, my passions for books led me to volunteer at the Multnomah County Library. My love of animals led me to volunteer for the Oregon Humane Society for over eight years. My passion for art led me to teaching. But as I've grown older in my career, my passion for STEM has expanded far beyond Legos. I've seen firsthand what a career in STEM can do for you, the livelihood it brings, and the capacity it leads to do more. I was able to graduate debt-free. I bought a house in my early 20s. But since the beginning, my interest in engineering, I have often been the only one who looked like me. I'd grown very used to that experience, particularly growing up in Portland, continuing to do work twice as hard and managing more projects than many of my peers, I always thought that the work would show for itself and that it would garner respect. Until I worked a short stint in a different bureau where I was once again one of few women, but specifically the youngest and the only black woman in that, in that field. My efficiency with technology was berated. I was told to simmer down and my age was brought up in almost every instance. The job nearly pushed me out of engineering. I was tired, and I realized I needed to be around other folks that looked like me, that could at least let me know that I wasn't alone in these experiences. I started researching other black engineers in Portland and found that there were not that many, but I did discover the National Society of Black Engineers and that Oregon's chapter hadn't existed for about four years. Here's a tip, cold emails and reaching out to random people on the internet, sometimes you can make a community that way. <laughs> I found an engineer, an actual rocket scientist, who worked at Intel, and he told me about a couple engineers in his group who were also interested in starting a Nesby chapter. Three of us, some pictured here, started a small Nesby chapter in 2018 and is now expanded to over 60 black engineers in the metro area. We don't just service Portland, but we service Washington as well. We're in the middle of starting an Oregon Collegiate chapter where all black engineering students at Oregon schools, PSU, uh, PSU, OSU, PCC, University of Portland, and the other community colleges will now have a place to find other engineers that look like them so they don't enter the workforce alone. Our mission is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. The slide here shows some of the different things that we do. The picture on the left where we're all dolled up is at the United Negro College Funds Banquet and fundraiser. This small group of five, engin or, yeah, five engineers there make up our board, we actually have a few more, but this small group of five is actually more than I've ever seen in my workforce. So it was a huge relief to meet other engineers like me. The flyer on the right is just one of the many events that we host where we share career opportunities, professional development opportunities, and try to volunteer probably way more than we, <laughs> than we have capacity for. Uh, which shows a picture in the middle. We're trying to always increase the pipeline of engineers. So this picture in the middle is our tiny wind farm we made with you out of paper plates. We had 16 of them, that's just four. The Nesby logo there is a torch and that's carrying the torch for the next generation. So like I'm kind of getting at, representation matters. It's hard to be what you cannot see. Being able to work in these fields is one of the ways we can actively apply our experiences and knowledge to the work. According to a study in, by Georgetown last year, they said it would take 76 years for black and Latino engineers to diversify the workforce in par with white engineers. That is a long time and not soon enough. This number is even more stark for Native American engineers at 0.07%, one out of 13,000. Engineering, and I'll be biased and say civil engineering, built infrastructure, like water accessibility, land use decisions, and projects that impact people directly. We desperately need more of us at the table. 
The unfortunate truth, with much of white culture dominating engineering today, is that if it doesn't affect them, they will not consider black and brown folks in the design. I just pulled a bunch of headlines, which show that this is a problem. Report, black students underrepresented in high paying STEM majors. Mission not accomplished. Unequal opportunities and outcomes for black and Latinx engineers. STEM's racial, ethnic, and gender gaps are still strikingly large. After years of gain, black STEM representation is failed, is falling. Why? While it's not activism in the traditional sense to be an engineer, representation and a seat at the table where these decisions are made, where such designing infrastructure like water access and conveyance, those are all needed to make tangible change. If we're not directly designing or involving, involved in this work, we'll be left out of it. I talk about engineering as service, not just because civil engineering is innately that, but because many BIPOC engineers I've met also work tirelessly outside of their engineering roles. We are on hiring panels, diversity panels, advocates for equity and contracting so that more diverse companies gain access to the economic development from projects like I've shown in previous slides, but we're also volunteering to increase the pipeline for future engineers. And while I know not everyone wants to be an engineer, the more representation we have in these fields, the easier it is for us to bring our communities the resources and infrastructure they need. Media and representation is also important, especially if they can help tell a story that's not often told. I've been lucky to have been given many opportunities to share my story. Here's an NBC series I was a part of called Discovering You, which highlighted women in engineering careers. The goal was to encourage more young girls to go into engineering. I was also in the Time for Kids STEM issue, which highlighted the Culver project that I shared pictures of earlier. Outside of investing my time and taking opportunities to share what it is like being an engineer who looks like me and with my experiences, I also invest dollars for a future generation. I started the Brandon Diversity and Engineering Scholarship for BIPOC female identifying students at the University of Portland, my alma mater, which I personally donate funds to, but it is also an open scholarship. To my surprise, the scholarship has donated or raised over $10,000 since its origination in 2020. I also serve on boards and volunteer with orgs whose mission align with diversifying STEM and building a pipeline to future uh, engineers. I've talked a lot about my decade-long passion with STEM and engineering and diversifying it, but more recently, I've gained a new passion. In 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, like many Americans, I was pushed into wanting to do more civically. I joined the Portland National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and AACP. I knew that was the org where community came together and worked for advocacy and social change for black communities. I joined the Political Action Committee with them, where several conversations kept going back to environmental racism and the burden that climate change puts on the Portland's frontline communities. Frontline communities, for those who don't know, is a term used for communities who face the brunt of climate change's impacts. That's traditionally low-income black and brown communities. They face higher temperatures, poor air quality, closer proximity to polluters, and house in what is considered less desirable land. With my background in environmental engineering and environmental science, I knew these issues. But with my background living in North Portland, having grown up there, I also lived those issues. My entire family has asthma. I grew up near a freeway. I also had limited access to parks as I got older. It almost hit me like a rock that environmentalism wasn't just about being vegan or hugging trees. Environmentalism as a narrative was just another space that I didn't see people who look like me. Seeing environmental justice and what that means for communities led me to a whole new focus era, area, something that was also hugely important to me. I was appointed the Environmental Justice Committee Chair of the NAACP of Portland. It's a role I recently set down from. My committee grew from over 20 people. We passed a few bills. We sent lots of advocacy letters. We received thousands of grants, or thousands of dollars in grants and I led a youth in nature leadership program for two years. This picture on the left shows an article that highlighted the program I started. And that year, through the last two years, over 20 youth were trained by Metro staff to lead hikes for community in a train the trainer program. 
I wanted to copy outdoor school, but specifically for BIPOC youth. It also provided exposure to hiking in nature, and we also had a lot of environmental careers highlighted with folks that look like our students. For some of my students, it was their first time ever hiking. Living in Oregon, I had never been on a hike. I've never camped, even so to this day, because I didn't gather enough funding to make that happen, too. <laughs> <laughs> you would also be surprised how quickly the kids caught on to this foundation in environmental justice and talking about it. The kids noticed how far away they had to walk to be under trees. They also noticed how close the forest was to a highway. It was the perfect foundation, but also engaging. Speaking of tree canopy, my passion for environmental justice led me to grant writing to support the programs I wanted to start, but also applying for unique opportunities. I'm currently a Harvard Climate Justice Design Fellow, where my project is making data more accessible for communities of color uh, while exploring urban heat dome and tree canopy equity. A lot of times when we talk about the impacts on people of color, we hear disproportionate, disproportionate this and disproportionate that, and it's traditionally within government or academia. Well, communities of color are not always in those spaces, so data is being talked about with us not at the table. A lot of ways we interpret our experiences and, and relate them to data is why community stories, sharing how we experience something. So-and-so had to borrow an air conditioner from their neighbor. So-and-so's cat died that summer. Or my grandma didn't have an AC and she stayed with us for the weekend. That is how we know that climate is impacting us. And Portland specifically had record temperatures last June. So I wanted to make a project that highlighted community stories, qualitative data compared with quantitative data. So the picture on the right shows my fellowship project that I'm currently working on. We finalized the end of this year, and it highlights tree canopy in Multnomah County, community stories, and urban heat index. And the interesting thing, and almost predictable, is that the hotter the temperatures usually meant the least tree canopy. And a lot of those neighborhoods are associated with lower income and where there's a lot more pavement. I've already talked about my passion for depaving a lot of streets and building gardens. <laughs> it all ties together. Separately, talking about oneself is probably easiest, the easiest thing to do and the hardest thing to do. Tying in art into my passions in environmental justice and engineering doesn't always directly relate. But holistically, it's a huge part of my life. Society often pushes us to pick one thing. When I decided to major in engineering, I was at the time in an international baccalaureate IB program in high school. I had scored a seven on my higher level exams, which was a score worldwide very few people get. I had to make the decision to pick engineering or art to major in. And engineering is just really hard to major in another thing at the same time. I knew I would have to put art on a back burner for a little bit, but I never gave it up. My art theme has always been social injustice. My art always is trying to make a statement. It's mixed media assemblage inspired by folks like Joseph Cornell and Betty Saar. And I like the art to speak for itself. And sometimes my art makes people uncomfortable, which I've learned since receiving um, my grant award from the 2020 Jordan Schnitzer Black Lives Matter grant program. I created a piece with roots and history talking about the unjust police system using a lot of symbolism. I share my art to show that people are holistic. We can be more than our careers and that there is so much more life to live outside of work. We make time for the things that we care about. I'm trying to refrain from saying I don't have the time for this when new opportunities show up. And I'm trying to say I haven't made time for that yet. I also know that time and capacity to provide service are a privilege, something I'm grateful that I have the capacity to have. And this is a, a summarized version of my, my portfolio. Outside of mixed media assemblage, I'm also a hand weaver. I've been weaving since I was about eight years old, and in high school, I was an apprentice to a local weaver, where I learned a lot of different techniques. Um, my Jordan Stitcher grant program actually expanded my scope to try and make a statement with weaving. So my weaving piece, which is not shown here, actually said Black Liberation. And that was my first time making a statement with textiles. So I'm a textile artist and mixed media.
So as I've stated before, I try to say yes as often as I can to new opportunities. The picture on the left is me at the 2019 Good in the Hood Festival. That selfie is me learning for the first time about being a switch tech on a live festival that was our first ever virtual stream of the festival. Somebody said, Jay's an engineer, she can do it. <laughs> and I said yes, and it's something I will never forget. The picture on the bottom right is from Multnomah County's Charter Committee bios. Every six years, Multnomah County revises its constitution or charter with a selected, with a selected committee. Folks in Multnomah County voted and passed all but one of the measures we proposed this year. It's a great week. I applied for the charter because I have seen so many times how few people who look like me are at the table, how few engineers are civically engaged, and I really wanted to make a more inclusive county. I was selected and served my term last year, and I learned a ton about politics. It's just another example of not only saying yes, but applying to, applying to be at the table. You won't always be asked or invited to take opportunities. Many of them must be self-imposed. And if you're not allowed at that table, leave and start your own. Mm. Just like with Nesby, sometimes you have to create your own community. On the right is the Columbia Boulevard Wastewater Treatment Plant. I like to call that treatment plant mid-century modern, because it is <laughs> old. It's my latest new adventure as a wastewater engineer. After a few years of working underground in collection systems, three months ago I started a new job at the treatment plant as a wastewater engineer. I always encourage what I call the pivot. Comfortable is nice, but learning is better. And I'll finish this presentation with that I'm still developing new passions. Finding a passion and finding passions is a lifelong journey. I encourage everyone at every age to try new things and speak your voice. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak, and I hope that you all make the time to do what is right and to make time for what you care about. to clean water, highway expansion, our tree canopy is dwindling, our temperatures are rising. All of those individually are big issues, but the fact that they're all compounded right now at the exact same time is, is overwhelming. It's actually part of the reason I sat down for my environmental justice role with the NAACP because I felt like I was on a swivel at each issue. Yeah. One person can't work on every single bill. One committee can't work on every single bill. We need more folks at the table. How do you approach this in terms of community and getting people really agitated about a lot of climate problems that we have? And, you know, we read down the news, but I think a lot of people don't really get the underlying causes for it. And is that part of what you've been doing, trying to get people to understand some of the basics? Why do we have to do that? In advocacy, that's one of the things that working with the NAACP is that we're an advocacy org. So we did a lot of programming, at least trying to tell people about what was going on. It's just, particularly with our um, communities of color, there's so, many, it's, there's so many other issues. And during 2020, we had police brutality, we had housing, economic injustice, and so climate was sometimes and often prioritized at the bottom of that, even though if you can't breathe because of the neighborhood you're in, or you have cancer from compounded fun fungus in your home, or crazy things in the water, if you're not alive, then you're not even gonna be able to face those other issues too. Um, so a lot of the things that I'm hoping to do with even things like my fellowship, um, making climate data more accessible, is just making it um, approachable. 
So when we talk about temperatures rising, people know what that feels like. They might not know what the data looks like. People know what being under a tree feels like, but they don't, and they know what it's like not to have any around them, but they don't exactly know about the data all the time. So sharing the verbal oral tradition, this is how a lot of my community remembers things, is what I'm trying to do with uh, at least my fellowship. And you're right, education is a huge part of climate justice, but it's also a lower priority when people are struggling to live first. Is the current system of selling carbon credits just kind of hiding the actual issue? Well, yeah, that's a big question, that one. <laughs> there is the cap and trade and the way that we handle, um, it, it's not hiding per se, it's just allowing leniency to certain folks and collaboration with corporations together to, uh, to, to save each other. Some people do better than others, and the ones who do better aren't exactly rewarded for it if it's getting passed on as a credit to someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to say thank you for adding that A into your STEM list to add arts. That's what makes us people. Holistic, right? Holy people, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Art's a huge passion for me, and I think it's really, I was really lucky to be able to go to an arts magnet school and a STEM magnet school rather than just honing in on one passion. Yeah. That sort of made me have to, I had to choose. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. And, and then. I'm curious, because you've obviously done a lot in your life. In your opinion, what's your greatest accomplishment? That is a good question. I have to say the thing personally that I've been most proud of to date is passing my professional engineering license. <laughs> and that's because it's a very hard exam and there are very few people who have it, less than 20% of engineers, and then you compound that with women, you compound that with being a woman of color. I'm still trying to get the data from Osfields on how many people of color have their license in Oregon. If they're listening to this, I'm gonna be bugging you some more. <laughs> I like being a squeaky wheel. <laughs> so that's something I'm most proud of right now. But I think my thing I'm most proud of is the impact I have on others. I have pushed a lot of kids into STEM, and they have a few of them have came back and gotten degrees and have told me that they have followed me and listened to what I said, even if they didn't know exactly what they wanted to do. And now they're glad. And that feels really good because also I get to work with them now, so I'm a little bit selfish that way. <laughs> Do you have any ideas of how to incorporate environmentalism into the new um, uh, city structure of governance so that it's part of the holistic approach to uh, making communities livable for everyone? Yes, I was actually invited to be a part of Charter Reform on Environmental Justice and adding that into the lens. Like I said, it oftentimes gets prioritized to the bottom and it didn't make it to your ballot. But I think it's gonna be a priority, especially when our cities start making goals. It's very easy for someone to say, in 2035, we're gonna be zero emission. Well, 2035 is just around our corner now. So now we have to rush to be accountable to that. And it's gonna be engineers that help make that happen. It's gonna be planners and community that tells us what they want to make that happen. Um, and a lot of that, is sometimes starting with just a committee and asking the community what they want and what do they notice and what do they need. And then having an engineer build what is needed or having a planner design what is needed and having all those people together at the right place to make those decisions where it's not just a hierarchy of council members voting on the day or nay on things now. But it is a priority and I'm really excited about it and I'm curious to see how it will play out in the future of our cities. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions on how we can get more students into STEM programs? That is my lifelong mission, <laughs> <laughs> particularly gals and people of color. And I think it's starting younger. There was a lot of focus for going to high school because they're right, they're right at that next to jump the path into engineering and go major in it. But if you're not prepared for it, you haven't been exposed to it, it's really hard. So that's why I think things like Lego Robotics worked for me when I was young. And so now I've been pivoting a lot of my work into working with youth 
building rule structures like um, wind turbines out of recycled materials, but also um, pairing with orgs like Building Blocks of Success, who work with black and brown youth in like robotics, um, actually they're doing health programs and on their board of directors as well. So trying to start young so that people just know that it's something they can be and think about, just like when they know about firefighters or being um, a president, thinking of engineering, just putting that in their careers as well, something that kids see and think about wanting to be. I think a lot of people don't know the economic stability that comes from STEM also, like rather than just being a movie star or a musician, if they saw most engineers are doing fairly well and able to provide for themselves and others, I think people would choose that because capitalism is still very real around here. Mm -hmm. Weaving is, I didn't really get to touch on it as much as I should have, but weaving is actually the perfect art for someone who likes math, because yeah. you have to come up with your patterns. And as a kid, apparently I was very good at doing that stuff in my head. Now I have to graph it out, and I make myself a graph for my patterns. <laughs> but I learned a couple different types of techniques, and they're all actually very transportable. The one I'm teaching my student on the right um, is tablet weaving, and so you make thin belts. Um, the one in this picture in the middle, that is on an Inkle Mapuche frame loom. A lot of folks are familiar with Richard Heddle or the European industrialization of weaving where it's many heddles that go up and down and multiple harnesses and it's huge and takes up a whole room. I have two of those too, so I know about that. But I really like this indigenous style of weaving because it feels closer to my roots. Weaving is everywhere. Patterns and colors are a way to denote certain tribes and heritage, and so this feels most akin to my culture um, as a Filipino and black gal. So um, this style is actually South American. Mm -hmm. that, that was a manual. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Very cool. okay. Open everything with my hands <laughs> and have back problems from sitting like that. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the gorgeous picture of your. The one, the four on the right. So it's actually about six different pieces. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I like making the small scale just because size is of an essence, and at the time I didn't have a lot of space. <laughs> sure. Now I have a full room for my art. Beautiful. Thank you. Question in the back. I have a question. I want to call your attention to a recent cover article in Scientific American where women archaeologists have started asking for and seeking textiles that digs have just tossed away and the science they've done and studying the role of women in Viking society based on their study of the textiles to me is fascinating. If you haven't read it yet, it's like the last vision for this. I'm going to look that up. That sounds amazing. I love anything weaving. I have a bit of a weaving collection uh, of books as well and magazines. Some uh, information you mentioned about your name. You have a unique name. Yes. So my name is Jereisha. It's J apostrophe R E Y E S H A. I'm named after my father who's sitting in this room, Jure. That name, when I showed up to kindergarten class, uh, my teacher tried a few times and then just said J. <laughs> and it stuck for almost 30 years. 
And that was fine for a while. Uh, I tried to go back to it in college when I started applying for jobs. Dre Isha with an apostrophe was not getting me any interviews. Hmm. I didn't have a simple internship. I couldn't, I wasn't getting any feedback at all. So I switched it to J in my senior year, and all of a sudden I had many an offer. And when I walked into the door, I literally would watch a visible stare of confusion when they looked down at the resume and expect that they were getting a white male, which makes when people think of an engineer, that's that is the the norm. Um, but having Jay got me into the door, and I needed that for the first few years of my career. Uh, J A Y, and it's something I got really used to because it sounds like a boy name. It's easy to say. Uh, Jerisha, having it as a URL for a website, people never get it right, so I'm pretty sure no one looks at my website. <laughs> so J A Y is really nice. But now that I have my license, and now that I am not an entry level engineer anymore, and I want to be 100% authentically myself, Jerisha is the name I like to use now, and it's new in the last two months. So even my close friends still call me J, and that's okay because they're friends. But coworkers and new people I meet. You can say Joukowsky, you can say Jeresha. So that's my new, that's a bit about my name in the background. Um, and it feels really good to just put Jeresha brand in PE and not have J there. Hey, I finished up so much earlier, I'm so sorry. I gave a run through. <laughs> it was longer. But maybe that's what practice makes it faster. <laughs> No other questions. Um, are you okay with wrapping up? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.